Hey, we've got another piece of uh, Tektronix gear on the bench here today. It's a Tektronix SG503 leveled sine wave generator. Basically, it puts out a, uh, a sine wave that whatever level you set, it's going to stay at that exact level no matter what frequency you set it to. From anywhere from, uh, like, was that 0.25 megahertz or a bit lower, up to 250, just over 250 megahertz. Uh, perfect for calibrating scopes and whatnot. Um, now I'm going to preface this video with a bit of an introduction because I wasn't going to make a video on this. Uh, it was going to be just a bit of a spit polish, clean it up, and then do an internal adjustment and that's it. Nothing too uh, groundbreaking or interesting at all. But it turned out there was a couple of faults in this unit which uh, needed to be repaired. So I did turn the camera on part way through and uh, then film the rest of the repair. So uh, we'll jump into it. It'll be a little bit abrupt, but just bear with me. And uh, yeah, we'll get this thing all nice and shiny as you see here and working perfectly so uh, let's get to it alright so there's another little thing I'm going to look at here uh, these chips which are uh, sitting up from the bottom so there's one that's down these ones are sitting up they're in the uh, sockets these ones are actually in the sockets this one here and this one over here they're lower because the sockets are actually in the socket board they're fine these ones are sitting up they're in the uh, the good old Texas Instruments uh, IC sockets and they are a known failure point they go bad all the time I'm not sure if these are bad yet, but I'm going to replace all of them with uh, turned pin style sockets because uh, I don't want to be chasing ghosts and uh, you know, spinning around in circles trying to figure out why it's not working when one pin here might be uh, not making good contact. These uh, Texas Instrument style uh, sockets are yeah, really bad. They all go bad eventually and um, yeah, there's something that's got to be removed and replaced. So there's quite a few in here. So I'm going to go ahead and suck them all out, and uh, yeah, I've got a uh, good old pile of uh, new sockets to put in. Just pulling some of these chips out, and uh, what is going on there? That is looking horrible. I know that's just a bit of surface tarnish or what, but it looks almost like it's starting to get a bit of rusty. Good old Texas Instruments chips, strikes again. That's a uh, 7490, and uh, yeah... I might see if I can just clean those legs up and uh, re-tin them, but I'm not too uh, impressed with that. So uh, some of the others have done the same. Some of them are a bit, how you doing? Some look fine. So uh, I might uh, I might see how this one cleans up. If it's a bit difficult, a bit too time consuming, I might just replace it with new ones. Um, I don't want to stick these into a socket and have them corroding in there with the new sockets. But we'll see how we go. Also, if you're wondering how to tell if you've got uh, the uh, text instruments sockets they look like that with the uh, little uh, which way up is it uh, maybe that way I can't remember but you can kind of see in there if I get the light just right you can see the logo you'll see the text instruments logo inside and they basically look like that if you've got these yeah get rid of them they're terrible because they don't uh, grab onto the flat of the leg so if you see there you got the uh, the flats they're kind of like flat that way from the package. If the package is long, the legs are this way. Often the spring-loaded ones, the two contact like cheap sockets, they, uh, they hold like this. The ones I'm using, these turret-based ones, these little uh, circular ones, they actually hold all sides. So when you push the leg in, they're holding on the sides and on the flats. These text instruments ones, they only hold on the sides. So you've got tiny little points of contact, and they're on the cut edge of the, uh, the leg of the IC. So it's kind of like an uneven edge, whereas on the flat, it's much more even and easier to make a good contact. So that's why these text instruments ones fail all the time. Yeah, they're, they're pretty crap. So uh, I don't know if that's going to be able to zoom in properly, but that's one of the legs. That's gonna, I don't know if that's focusing. Maybe it's focused. But you can see the shape there, the two little fingers like this sort of shape, which uh, grab onto the, uh, the sides of the leg and give you a dubious contact. Alright, so I've got all the uh, sockets replaced and uh, a bunch of these chips. Yeah, I'm going to replace them. Not all of them. A lot of them, the legs are fine, but there's a bunch where it's like... I started cleaning them up with the uh, little fiberglass pen, this thing here. And uh, they started to come up okay, but I noticed when I looked real closely under the microscope that the plating has obviously been like corroded or worn or rusted away so that's no good and then uh, one of them the uh, here it is here 
you can see the legs started to break because it's corroded through so much that the uh, the legs started to break off. So a lot of those are going to be just thrown out and uh, I'm going to get new ones. I can get them in the Kihabara for a dollar each, or uh, 100 yen each. So uh, any chip that has uh, corroded legs, I'm just going to replace um, just straight up. Uh, now, I was poking away at stuff because when I turned it on, it didn't work. Um, there's not much to show, it just didn't give an output. So, yeah, it's not that interesting to show you nothing. And um, as I was poking around, I found that the oscillator, which is down the bottom here, you can see this little can here, right down the very bottom of the screen. I'll uh, try and bring up the exposure a bit. Uh, it's a bit intermittent. Um, sometimes when I turn it on, I get no oscillation whatsoever. And uh, then after a period of time, after I've put my tongue in the right position and the moon's come into the phase and uh, Jupiter's lined up with Mercury, it starts oscillating. I don't know what the conditions are to make it oscillate yet, but it seems to just happen. So I'll see if I can get it happening to show you what's going on here. But it's still, once it starts oscillating, the rest of the circuit still needs to be looked at, so we've got to figure out what's going on later on uh, down the line. But um, over here I've got the uh, schematic. So you can see this is the oscillator section here. We've got our uh, crystal, one megahertz crystal, some uh, capacitors and uh, whatnot, and it's just a standard oscillator. We've got the uh, inverter buffers and stuff. And it comes across out of the U460D, which is uh, this chip at the end of my finger right here. Um, and then it comes straight into U465, which is the missing one here. Because if you see where I've marked it in green, that's actually a, a test point. Is on pin 14 of the chip that I've removed and that is the top left pin so that's what we're going to probe so basically what I've done is I've isolated the oscillator section from the rest of the circuit so we can test just the oscillator got my scope here hopefully you can see the screen I'll try and adjust the, uh, the exposure to to bring that up a bit more clear when uh, the time comes so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick my probe my proboscis if I get the uh, ground point there, and we're getting nothing on the screen here. I'll bring that exposure hopefully a bit better. Maybe you can see it there. Going to blow out the rest of the colours, but that's all right. Um, now, if I turn this on, it just has like a DC offset of like one volt uh, and nothing. And if I tap the thing and I you know, put my f capacitively load bits of the circuit up with my finger, nothing seems to happen to kickstart it. But occasionally it'll just start. And then it starts putting out the uh, 1 megahertz there. And it's a nice square wave because it goes through the, uh, the TTL buffer chip, uh, inverter buffer, so that makes it a nice square wave. And things just work. And uh, if I probe other parts of the chip, they're still... Well, there's something there. Hey, did it start? Did it start? It started. It just started. So sometimes it just starts like that. And now that, even though it's a bit weird, hang on, I'll adjust the, uh, there we go, adjust the uh, trigger. So that is now 1 megahertz. Um, measure. What's it say? Yep. 1 megahertz right there. I don't know if you can read it. But that is what I want. But it doesn't always just start. It should just as soon as you turn on, it should be giving one megahertz before I can even put my probe on the uh, on the pin. So this this unit, I'll turn it off before I unplug it. This unit seems to have been dropped in its previous life. You can see there's some damage here. That's been dropped, bang! And the chassis was slightly twisted, so I've I've loosened the screws off and straightened it and tightened it back up, and it's it's all right now. But I wonder if that chip has been cracked or it's been damaged somehow when it was dropped. And it's faulty. All right, so here's our bad crystal. We know it's bad because I wrote bad on it. And I have desoldered it so we can have a look inside. So that's what a crystal looks like. This is a larger one. But that's basically it. Now, there's nothing obviously bad except just at the end of my pointer, there's a little chip on the corner. I wonder if that's maybe what's happened. And it's throwing this thing out so it doesn't oscillate properly until it, you know, Venus lines up with Mercury and uh, I've got the proper coloured socks on and all that sort of stuff. But that, anyway, is going away. And I hit up eBay. 
and got some of these little Vectron oven controlled crystal oscillators. All right, I'm going to interject here, uh, interrupt myself, just to uh, make a bit of an editor's note before anyone tells me I'm being ridiculous, which I am. Uh, yes, putting an oven control crystal oscillator in this thing is ridiculous, and I'll explain why. Uh, I'm only doing it because I got these things cheap, and I was buying them anyway, so I had one spare, so I thought, hey, I may as well use it and, you know, have some fun. And that's basically all I'm putting this in for, is just to have some fun. Uh, there is no reason to use an oven controlled crystal oscillator in this location in this unit because it has no effect whatsoever on the output. If you put the oven controlled crystal oscillator in, like I'm doing now, the output from the unit will not become more precise or accurate or anything. It won't affect it whatsoever because the output is defined by a separate RC network, an RC oscillator, that's resistor capacitive oscillator, which is completely separate. The only thing this will do is make the uh, front panel display, where it's reading the uh, the frequency to tell you what you've set it to, uh, more stable and more accurate. But it's only three digits, so there's not really any reason to do this. Uh, if you need to replace the um, the crystal in your unit, uh, it's it's better, well, uh, quicker, easier, and cheaper to do it with just a standard crystal of the uh, correct. Um, the correct specifications using an ovenized crystal oscillator eh don't bother um, I'm like I said I'm just doing it because I'm having some fun and just for a laugh all right on with the show these are uh, you buy these just you know from China they're surplus from telecommunications equipment they actually come on a, the circuit board because they just like a bandsaw just cut the thing out you know with the circuit board still attached and yeah you got to desolder yourself so I bought two of them just because you know if I'm gonna buy one I might as well buy two they're pretty cheap and I come up with this circuit. So basically this is going to sit around about here on a piggyback circuit board, which um, I've designed. And it'll wire into the 11.5 volts. I tested everything. So I've tested this under all operating conditions. How much power that draws from that rail. And then how much this draws when it's heating up. Because that's when it's uh, drawing the most power. And it only does that for, I don't know, 20, 30 seconds. And then it's up to temperature. And yeah, it's all fine. The... Um, it's within the specs of the uh, the TM500 mainframes. So we've got basically a regulator here, 12 volts, 11.5 uh, volts, sorry, down to 5 volts. That's just a 7805 voltage regulator. A couple of capacitors there. Uh, it comes around, powers this one, which is a 5 volt oven control crystal oscillator, and the uh, TTL chip there. That's a divider because these are 10 megahertz as a standard. Uh, a standard frequency for most stuff. Most things you'll find are at 10 megahertz because it's just a nice round number, I guess. But we need one megahertz. So this chip is doing a divide by 10. Uh, this pot up here is the trim pot for the frequency. So uh, these don't have a, a hole where you stick your screw in, your screwdriver in, and uh, trim it up and down. One of these pins, it's a voltage controlled crystal oscillator. So it's a voltage controlled oven controlled crystal oscillator, VC OCXO. And uh, trim pot just uh, you can alter it between 0 volts and 5 volts as a voltage divider and it will trim this up and down by a certain amount so you can get it spot on. So that all works and I have, you can see with the yellow wire here, I had that plugged in and it works perfectly. No delays in starting up, it just pop and it's working as soon as you turn it on. Well not pop but bang or whatever. So as usual, I spoke to my good friends at PCBWay and I said, hey, I've got another project. And they said, hey, we've got some PCBs. So on my desk here, we have PCBs. Oh, and we got some stickers and we got a pen. Fantastic. I like getting pens because I always lose them. So uh, let's just uh, do the honors. I'll put that right there because they're a sponsor and um, you've got to do the right thing by the sponsors and if you are uh, if you want your sticker front and center somewhere in this area hey feel free to contact me <laughs> test equipment Keysight Tektronics give me some test equipment <laughs> yeah right so here's a circuit boards but 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 beautiful as always, never have a problem with the quality of PCBWay. Yes, they're a sponsor. Yes, I'm saying good things, but I'm saying good things because it is very warranted. Mm -mm -mm. Little ones this time. And on the other side, on the flip side, 
SG503 oven control crystal oscillator. Fantastic. So basically we're going to have input and output here. We've got our frequency adjust pot sits there. A couple uh, diodes and capacitors for the voltage regulator. The voltage regulator sits there. And see that big pad? That's so when I screw it down, it's got a good thermal contact to the middle there. And it's uh, going to use a whole ground plane on both sides. And this is going to be attached inside. Around about there. And I'm going to use these little square metal blocks. They're like a little square cube which uh, has a screw hole in multiple directions so you can I can screw the put the screw through here and here into the middle block and then that goes there and I can put screws through the side and that's going to make this uh, heat, this act as a heatsink all the way through to the case and keep that uh, voltage regulator nice and cool it only needs a uh, heatsink while the oven control crystal oscillator is warming up because it pulls about uh, 600 milliamps I believe Half an amp or so, just over half an amp. But once it's once it's warmed up, it's right down to 200 milliamps. So the um, area needs a heat sink while it's warming up for 20, 30 seconds. So that will be perfect. Of course, we got the uh, divide by 10 chip. It's a SN74HC390, 74HC390, and our crystal oscillator will sit like that. Mm -mm. So let's get the uh, soldering iron powered up. Get some parts pulled out of our our uh, breadboard and let's get this thing built <laughs> finished power in there's a ground there and then the uh, 10 megahertz out but also you can ground th through the chassis because the chassis of the uh, the unit is a ground as well either or and uh, yeah 5 volt regulator a couple protection diodes they're not strictly needed but it's nice to have them there just in case there's some backfeeding of voltages from the capacitors in the mainframe or whatever uh, they'll protect the uh, the regulator some capacitors as defined in the data sheet divide by 10 section here I only use half the chip, the other pins are just grounded so they won't be flapping in the breeze and causing any interference. Um, adjustment and of course the oven control crystal oscillator there. You can see the little square blocks I'm using. That'll just uh, allow me to screw it straight to the uh, side of the case. Because if I have measured correctly, they should line up with these holes. And yes they do. Fantastic. So I'll just countersink a couple of these and put some countersunk screws in to the inside one and two that way it will stay flush you can see there's some countersunk screws already there that kind of effect and then that's going to sit around there somewhere looking really smart so first up before we put it in we better test it just to make sure it works and actually I'll show you how to adjust one of these an easy way to adjust one of these you do need a a more precise reference than what you're um the thing you're adjusting, so like a rubidium standard, a uh, GPS standard, or if you're uh, lucky enough to have a cesium standard, that'll be perfect. But uh, yeah, I'm going to be using a Leo Bodnar uh, GPS standard. You'll find his name, type in Leo Bodnar GPS into Google and you'll find what I'm going to use. Uh, no sponsorship there, just a very happy customer. It's a very nice piece of kit. Okay, so we're all set up here now. I've got my scope. You can see the screen there, something's happening. We've got the uh, GPS reference here, which is going straight into channel 2. You can use it on uh, the external trigger if you want, but I'd prefer to have it in channel 2, so I've got two traces on the screen. I can see both of them, what they're doing. I'll explain that in a sec. We've got channel 1 comes around to... I've got a 10 megahertz test point on my board, so that's coming straight out of the, uh, the oven control crystal oscillator before that divide by 10. 
and uh, I could set this to 1 megahertz and use a 1 megahertz out, but 10 megahertz, yeah, I'll put a test point on there. And um, yeah, we've got it all connected up, and we've got something happening here. So the way that you can adjust your oven control crystal oscillators, or your crystal oscillators of any type, is you use the GPS, or your rubidium, or your cesium, or uh, high quality uh, crystal oscillator, as your reference, so I'm triggering off of that. That's the trace that's not moving, is the, what's coming out of here. The one that's moving is what's on my scope probe, which is coming out of here. And if that's moving like it is, it's not the same frequency. So what we need to do is dial this. You can see it's slowing down, slowing down. And once we get it to stop, it doesn't have to line up, but it just has to stop moving in relation. So both, uh, right about there, that is really close. Right there, I think. A little bit, tiny bit of drift. But you can get it dialed in really close. And if you if you know the time base, and you use a stopwatch and time how long it goes, it takes to go from one, uh, one line on the screen, one graduation, whatever they call it, to the next, you can actually work out how far out it is. Um, I won't bore you with those calculations now, but basically, at the end of the day, you just got to make it so it stops. And I'll let th this sit for a while, let it burn in and uh, settle down, and see it's coming back the other way. It's going to drift a little bit here and there until it's all stabilized. And then that's basically set. You don't have to touch it anymore. So what you can do is you can get a little bit of the old... Uh, now polish from the wife or the girlfriend or yourself and uh, put a little dot on the uh, the trim pot there and then it won't be bumped you know it's once it's set it's set and you won't need to uh, touch it again but um yeah put a little bit of red on there so that no one goes in and or if someone tampers with it you can see and it will stop it from moving with vibration and that sort of thing so i'll do that once this has been uh, all sorted out and as for the output that's one megahertz. I'm just reading just the one megahertz. I'm not referencing the GPS at the moment. Uh, I've changed the time base as well. So that's saying one megahertz there, and it's a nice, clean square wave. Perfect. So that's going to feed into the buffer chip on the, uh, the SG503, and that is good. So I've got my connector here wired in. It's just a uh, 2.54 millimeter or 0.1 inch uh, little header plug, similar to what they're using elsewhere in the, uh, the unit. And uh, that's wired for the 11.5 uh, volts and for the signal in. So I'll give you a bit of a close-up so you can see where it connects. So here, there used to be a resistor just between these two chips. And this is the bottom of the unit. So that's the top up here. If the resistor is going up and down, this connects into the top hole that's left over by pulling that resistor out. And uh, that then feeds into this chip here, the buffer chip, which then goes to here, the counter chip, and then into the rest of the circuit. Then for the... Uh, power, the 11.5 volts, there's a, just next to this resistor, there's a series of holes, and you want to go to the second, uh, second tab or second contact up, which is the first hole, and solder in there. You can see I put the capped on tape there, that's a good trick, so we've got to solder very close to those, uh, you see there's three holes, so there's what, the bottom tab, that's like 25 volt AC, and then 11.5 volt DC, and then the next two here, those two holes I haven't populated, that's uh, the ground, which is also ground to the chassis. So that's why I haven't got a third wire for the ground. I'm just going through the chassis. It, it grounds that screw there. So it comes from here straight to that screw to the chassis and then into our module. But um, I'll put the capped on tape there because um, if you put a bit too much solder there or you slip, you're going to put solder all on the gold fingers and that's no good. So the capped on tape just keeps the solder back at bay. And uh, we can peel that off. And it's all still perfectly gold. So... Next step is, uh, I guess I'm going to put this in, and uh, hopefully it works, and uh, we'll put it back together. Now there is one last thing I'm going to do, and uh, you'll see there's nothing on the front. These are the old ones here. I've taken them out because, da 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 da, da da da, look at this. New old stock, like brand new old stock front uh, aluminium panel because this one's a bit scratched up it's a bit fading whatnot this one is brand new it's much darker that there hasn't faded to purple 
beautiful. The plastic broken one with a brand spanker, brand new. So what happens is with these older ones, they had countersunk screws. Not a very good design decision because when you tighten that screw up, it puts outward pressure on the plastic, which over the years causes fractures on the sides there, there and there. You can see here where it's fractured right there and right there. And then when you're pulling the unit, the module in and out of the uh, the mainframe and you, you know, put it on your shelf and it bangs a bit, it cracks and they always, always crack around here. This one was dropped on this side, but yeah, I've got a few of these which are, are cracked on the sides there. I've actually got a few of these, more of these coming from uh, America. These came from a, from Germany, a uh, fantastic dude on the uh, EV bog forums. Uh, helped me out there because the seller wasn't going to sell outside Germany, but uh, there's a member on the forums there that's in Germany, and he uh, did a bit of a freight forward thing for me, which is greatly appreciated. So, yeah, we got all these. Oh, and there's the, uh, the inner shield panel. There's a new one of those. It came as a set of three. So um, this one here is a little bit... Oops. Whoops. A little bit... Uh, yeah, just from the screws and that. I might just replace that just because, so it's all brand new. And that can go on the front. And that can go in. So we'll be back in a moment and we should be good to turn it on. There we go. January 20, 1986. Like four years old. Nearly four years old. Huh. And it is as fresh as a day it was made. Beautiful. All right, we're all uh, finished here. So we've got the uh, new oven control crystal oscillator in there. I've replaced all those chips that were um, busted up with the corroded legs and the uh, the uh, sockets there. I've replaced a few resistors and capacitors around the place that were out of spec. And uh, we've got that new front panel. Look at that, looking beautiful. Resplendent in its glory. Mm -mm -mm. Brand new, because it basically is brand new. And uh, yeah, a few trim pots I've replaced with 10 turn, or 10 turn, 15 turn, something like that couple down in there so we can really dial it in so um I can't actually calibrate this properly at the moment because I need uh, a high precision uh, cable which I don't have and the uh, tectronics part which cost a few tens of dollars back in the day maybe 50 bucks or something I can't remember exactly but yeah they go on eBay secondhand for like three hundred dollars three hundred fifty dollars and I'm not paying that for a uh, a 36 inch or like what's that around about a meter <laughs> coax cable so uh Unless I can find one cheap, I'm going to have to find another cable, and apparently an RG400 cable, or maybe an RG223 with a dual shield uh, is good. Pomona make one of those, but the RG400, you can get those, um, yeah, there's a few places on eBay that make them, an American place on eBay that makes them that uh, might be might be working all right. So uh, they've been proven to uh, work quite well, but the RG58, which is what I've got here, um doesn't do so well in the uh, higher frequency ranges. It, it attenuates the signal a bit too much. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll play around with it with this, but uh, the the leveled values may be a little bit off in the higher ranges. So I'm going to have to get a cable, and uh, then I can calibrate this thing. And, um, yeah, because if I calibrate it to this, it's not going to be calibrated properly. So I've got this uh, hooked up to my scope. It's only a 60 megahertz scope. So the high ranges we can't really look at. It will literally show nothing um, up at 250 megahertz. So, um, yeah, we'll look at some of the lower ranges and uh, and play around um, down there. So I'll just set the uh, the exposure correctly for the screen there. I'll blow out the rest of the image, but we'll be able to see the, uh, the screen better. I'll turn it on. And there we go. We've got a sine wave. So I can uh, dial it up and down. And you see the sine wave doesn't alter in uh, amplitude. Now that might not seem such a big deal, but this is uh, this stays so close that you can be used for calibration. Um, yeah, it's got some pretty tight specs on the uh, amplitude. Now, this unit isn't actually designed for, uh, for accuracy in the actual frequency. Um, it's designed for accuracy in the amplitude. So if you use this as a, like a uh, function generator, you might find that it's not so accurate when you're trying to set the uh, set the frequency. Uh, it's going to be better now because we've got that oven control crystal oscillator, but that's not what this is actually designed for. It's designed for calibrating scopes and equipment where the frequency isn't so important, but the amplitude is very important. That's where this thing shines. So you can see there we're getting, uh, if I dial that all the way up there, was that 2.6 megahertz, and we're getting 
5.24 volts. Uh, the, the limitation on this reading here will be in the scope rather than in the, uh, the calibrator here, the uh, leveled sideways generator. So that's going to bounce around just a little bit, but we're going to get a ballpark figure. 5.2 volts. If I turn that down to uh, in that range, uh, get it just enough to a better read. Where are we? There we go. Uh, 1.3 megahertz. It's 5.2 ish volts. If I go up a range, still 5.2 ish volts. I'm saying ish simply because the uh, the scope is a limiting factor here. 5.2 volts. If I, if I wind that up, still 5.2 volts. We can go even higher. 5.2 volts. Maybe if I go one more, we might start running into the limitation of this cable where it starts attenuating. Um, oh, it's still not too bad. 5.16. If I go up, yeah, 4.9. 4 We're starting to see the uh, attenuation there. 4.5 volts. So that's not this thing attenuating. That's the cable at the higher frequency. It's starting to, to drop the signal. But that's good enough for me for now. It is working. It's making uh, sine waves in all the ranges and it's staying relatively level. Of course, I can I can dial that amplitude up and down as needed with the other dial on there. So that is working good. So that is basically it for this video. Um, the last thing to do, of course, is to... Uh, I've turned this off. Always turn your uh, mainframe on and off before you plug it in and unplug it so you make sure there's no power applied. Uh, you don't want to blow up your transistors or your power supplies in these because it can happen if you hot swap them. They're not designed for hot swapping. So let's uh, put the covers on. And that one there, there's an insulating panel on this side because it gets very close to the components here. I'll stick that one in there. And that is done. Fantastic. Beautiful. So that is an enthusiastic thumbs up. Two in fact. And there may be, you know, we, we, we may be seeing this again in the future for some more upgrades as um, I get around to them. So stay tuned and we'll see you in the next one.